In October of 2012, there was a game released on RPG Maker that centered on a young girl named Lisa. Titled after this young girl, the story of the game is subtly fleshed out from Lisa's exploration of a strange dreamlike environment. There are multiple tendrils of the story that stretch out through the numerous environments, and once they're all tied together, they craft a disturbing story of abuse, anger, and ultimately, sadness. Here is a summary of the main story of Lisa the First. Warning, this video will obviously contain spoilers for the story of Lisa the First. I recommend playing the game first to experience the story on your own before watching everything here. It's a much better experience that way. Now the story has been attempted to be put in an order of a linear narrative path that allows the best viewing experience, but it may be a little jarring due to the fact it contrasts with the freedom given by the game to explore the environment and uncover its story in any order you choose. So this may not be the exact way things play out, and may have happened for you differently but hopefully you still enjoy the video nonetheless. Finally, information revealed in the subsequent installments of the series will not be covered here. This video will focus only on the characters and events in this game to help keep everything concise. Now with all of that out of the way, let's get started. The game opens with Lisa standing alone in her room. Sparsely furnished, it seems ordinary enough, but when inspecting the bed, Lisa comments the sheets are filthy. When inspecting the dresser, she mutters he's taken away everything, implying negligence from her caretaker. She makes her way to the living room, where the eerie sound of a TV sounds out. Sitting on the couch, watching the TV, is a balding, bearded man with sunglasses, assumingly her caretaker. He doesn't hear her come down the stairs, but if she steps into his sight, he menacingly glares at her and orders her back to her room. It's quickly become apparent that this man cares little for Lisa, if at all. He doesn't ask why she's up, and doesn't even tend to her well-being. All that matters is she get back to her dirty, empty room so he can continue to watch TV alone. What other negligence or abuse she's experiencing under his care isn't known, but sick of the way she's living, Lisa decides to escape and returns to the living room, but this time sneaks behind the couch and slips out the front door. She follows the path leading away from the house through the woods beyond. Everything around her begins to get brighter as if the environment also feels her relief. Already, things seem to be going better for her, but the joy is short-lived as after crossing a bridge, Lisa enters a hellscape where the distorted sound of the TV echoes in her ears and the man's face stares blankly from a red pit haunting her every step. Something evil must have happened in that house. Something that Lisa carries with her. She eventually comes face to face with the man himself, who tells her she's wasting her time trying to escape from him. Lisa blacks out, later awakening on a carpet in a blue void. She wanders north and comes to a sort of lobby with several exits to choose from, several possibilities to escape the life she's known before. Lisa climbs the gray ladder, which leads to a mountaintop with a ladder descending into a hole and a door on the cliffside. She passes through the door and comes to a sprawling field of white. She explores the field, finding vibrant plant life, clear pools of water, and a smiling man in a suit, reminiscent of the bearded man from before. When she approaches him, a heart appears over his head, implying loving feelings between the two. Lisa is somehow comforted by this area and while exploring, finds two golden statues. When she steps between them, everything changes. The field of white turns to a red wasteland. The plants wither and die. The clear pools fill with muck. And the smiling man turns into a monster, wearing the clothes of the bearded man from the house. And he groans suggestively when interacted with. Lisa needs to escape and scrambles around searching for the exit but comes across a staircase that wasn't there previously. Curiosity gets the best of her, and she descends, coming to another wasteland and finding a plastic bag between two crosses. After picking it up, she discovers another part of the lobby stores items she comes across, allowing her to carry more than what she can hold in her arms. She notices a doorway in this inventory area that enters another room where a man resides. When approached, 
He merely tells Lisa he's waiting, but for what, he doesn't reveal. She also finds she can return to the lobby at will, allowing her to escape the wasteland. The powers of this strange land are mystifying, but Lisa continues exploring, passing through the red door, coming to a mountain trail similar to the one she was on earlier. She continues climbing the path, coming across some work gloves in a box that allows her to move heavy rocks from her path. When she reaches the top, she finds a little town, maybe a little place she can use to escape from the bearded man. Yet to her dismay, the only person that lives in the town is the bearded man. But strangely, there are multiple incarnations of him all over. He sits soaking in the river, while also sitting on a ledge staring at the sun. One of them gives her a banana for finding his hiding spot, and another runs around a field reiterating what he told her before. She can't escape him. Lisa wanders into a cement house where the man orders her to get her some rum. She finds a bar close by where a party rages inside, and like the rest of the town, the bearded man is the only attendant. The numerous partygoers are in various moods, and these range from ecstatic to angry and even ashamed. But most disturbing are the lewd comments the man makes towards Lisa, hinting at a perverse mood. Inside one of the bathrooms, Lisa finds the bartender, who gives her some rum. She hands the rum over to the bearded man in the cement house, who gives her a red key and orders her to leave. This key unlocks a red gate and a wooden fence in the northwest of the town. Lisa descends the stairs, and while traversing the red tunnel, finds the bearded man in a makeshift living room. He says he wants a banana, and when he sees Lisa has one, asks for hers, promising something good in return. It's an enticing offer, so Lisa hands him the banana, and he returns the peel. She leaves the tunnel, coming to a mountainside, where she crosses a nearby bridge and climbs down a set of stairs to enter a dark cave. She wanders for a bit until finding a cardboard box surrounded by white flowers. Inside is a dull razor blade. She returns to the mountainside, but this time uses the rope to climb to the top. At the mountain's summit, she finds a head sticking out of the ground. This submerged man seems to be the same man she found in the inventory space from earlier. This time, when she talks to him, he slut shames her, finishing by saying he'll always cut through her mind. And indeed, the word cut rings in her head. She draws her newly obtained razor and slashes the head, making blood gush forth and seemingly killing the head there on the mountaintop. Lisa begins her climb back down, and finds a new bridge stretching across the chasm next to the mountain that wasn't there before. She crosses the bridge to another mountaintop, where she finds the same head sticking out of the ground, blocking a staircase. When she approaches him, he mocks her for thinking her attack would get rid of him. He ends the conversation by telling her she'll have to swallow him. With no way to go on, Lisa returns to the lobby. She crosses the threshold of the yellow door to enter a room filled with water. She considers the possibility that by crossing this vast sea, she'll be able to get away from the bearded man, until she finds him swimming in the still water. She also finds him floating on a raft, muttering banana peel over and over again. When he sees Lisa has one, he begs for it. She hands it to him, and he floats away, leaving a napkin behind on his raft. Lisa continues on, coming upon a small island with thick cattails blocking a staircase. Hacking down the weeds with a razor, she descends into the caves below and stumbles in the darkness for a time until coming to a disgusting sight. Spiders have made their den down here and all have the face of the bearded man. She evades the spiders, eventually clambering up a red ladder at the cave's end. As she climbs, the darkness below turns red and the bearded man's face menacingly peers out from the red glow. But not just one, hundreds. And they all surge past at a bewildering pace. Lisa eventually comes to a small platform that holds two items, a lamp and a bottle of old pills. Looking at the pills reminds her of the head that taunted her, the one that said she'd have to swallow it. That phrase echoes in her mind. She'll have to swallow him? Well, 
She's got something for him to swallow now. She returns to the head and stuffs the pills down its throat, causing him to vanish. She climbs down the stairs and finds a sword planted in the ground. She draws it from its place and returns to the lobby. She climbs the red ladder and proceeds down the path until coming to a seemingly innocuous town filled with religious symbols, but is absolutely covered in bile. The filth has choked the plant life, tainted the water, and even mutated the residents, all of whom are twisted monstrosities, most of which revere the religious iconography that covers the town. The only resident that isn't a mutated monster as a man in the northeast corner. Wanting a napkin, he takes Lisa's, presumably to clean off bile that he's come in contact with, and gives her a severed finger in return. In the northwest corner, Lisa finds a house which stands featureless, save for a cross standing in the lone room of the building. When she interacts with it, a hatch opens, revealing a set of stairs that goes to a cave system below the town, where she finds another spider's den. She makes her way through, and in the back of the cave, finds another head with its body submerged in the ground. This one seems to give her a warning, or threat. I will take your breath away. Sick of the threats these heads have thrown her way, Lisa pulls forth the plastic bag she found earlier and immerses the head, suffocating him. A VHS tape appears after the head vanishes. Titled Tricky Rick, Lisa picks up the token and returns to the lobby where she sits before the TV and plays the tape. She sees herself climbing down a mountain and then coming face to face with the submerged man again, but this time he stands free from the ground. When Lisa approaches him, he greets her and tells her his name is Rick. He goes on saying he likes exploring caves, likes friction, and describes himself as a sensitive guy. After a pause, he notes that Lisa already knew all of that. He says he hopes to see her soon and asks her not to go too far because he'll be waiting. The tape then abruptly ends. As Lisa tries to understand what Rick meant in the video, she wanders up the gray ladder again, coming to the mountaintop. She realizes she hasn't gone down the hole yet, so she descends the ladder to find a small abode with a man standing in the corner mumbling to himself. When she approaches, he turns, revealing a disfigured face, and without saying a word, takes the finger Lisa was given earlier, and gives her another VHS tape. Lisa plays this one, titled Marty, upon her return to the lobby, and it shows the bearded man, the one from the house at the beginning, alone in a white field with flowers dotted around. He wanders for a bit before coming to a man sitting with a girl in a field of flowers with a table between them. Upon closer inspection, the girl with her long black hair and simple white dress is Lisa, and sitting across from her is the bearded man, and not the cold, uncaring man he is now, but a loving, pleasant one with a smile on his face and love in his heart. Between the two is a plastic tea set. The two were having a little tea party between them, and suddenly the relationship between the two becomes clear. The bearded man, Marty, is Lisa's father, and the relationship used to be filled with love. But Marty is no longer this doting man, and Lisa has suffered under his care, leading her to want to escape. The tape ends with Lisa's return to the lobby. With all previous roads leading to dead ends, Lisa approaches the gray door, hoping behind it is a path to freedom. She finds a room that seems cut out of the wilderness, the floor is covered in grass and flowers, and there's a waterfall cascading into a small pond behind the door. There's also a golden statue sitting inside a fenced-in area in the corner, and in the opposite corner, peeking out over the wall, is the shaded stare of Marty. When approached, he says Lisa needs the sword, but for what, he won't say. Lisa approaches the golden statue and notices a small hole in the crotch. Curious, she takes the sword she found and inserts it into the slot, and she is suddenly transported to a mansion. She strolls through the empty halls, finding extravagant fountains and luxurious chambers. It's a far cry from Lisa's dirty home, and it's clear that whomever lives here does so in comfort. 
Maybe she's found a new place to call home. But in the back room, Lisa finds a grotesque sight. There's a mound of fleshy tissue covered with bile and filth, and on top sits the face of Marty. Even in this lavish manner, Lisa can't get away from her father. As she stares at this oozy monstrosity, Lisa realizes that Marty was right. She can't escape him. Everywhere she's gone, he's dogged her steps. Maybe she should try something else. Instead of running, maybe she could find the strength to confront him instead, hoping that by doing so, she can finally be free of this monster. She inches closer, unafraid of the mutant in front of her. She climbs behind the oozy mass and is transported out of the mansion into a red void. She wanders forth, following a trail of trash and bile, until eventually coming upon herself. By confronting the monster, she has found herself and begun to heal. The screen fades to white, perhaps symbolizing the start of her new life, one in which she's free of her father. Yet it eventually fades out, and Marty now stands in front of her. Just confronting the monster wasn't enough. There must be something more she needs to come to terms with. Lisa will have to confront exactly what happened to her. She has made steps in the right direction though, as she finds a necklace upon her return to the lobby. It's something very precious to her, and gives her strength to go on. She goes to the inventory space and finds candles now cover its floor. She checks the room below, and Rick is now missing, replaced by a candle. She inspects the candle, and is suddenly transported back to her room in her home. The moment has come for her to confront her father, and finally be free. She proceeds to the living room, but this time is instead taken to a black void. Determined, she goes on, until coming to Marty, who is sitting naked, revealing the torment Lisa suffered at his hands. Her father had been molesting her. Seeing the stark truth in front of her suddenly reveals what her whole journey has been about. She was never actually physically escaping from her prison, from her father's house. From the very beginning, Lisa's entire adventure has been her attempt to escape this memory and repress it deep in her mind. Yet, like Marty says, she can't escape it, symbolized by her father haunting her every step, everywhere she goes. And eventually, this memory drags itself up out of the dark recesses of Lisa's mind and presents itself in all its horror. Lisa doesn't have the strength to confront this, and so does now what she always does, withdraws back into a safe place in her mind. As she tries to blank out the image of her trauma, a voice sounds out in the emptiness. You really don't get it, do you? You really thought you could forget? Why are you trying so hard? Accept it. You can't fight something that already happened. There is no understanding, no purpose. There is only life, and this one is yours. Accept it. I'm here to stay. The story ends with a fade into Lisa scrambling around an abyss filled with the face of her tormentor. Even in the depths of her mind, she can't escape him, and will live the rest of her life under the agony of his perversion. Yet, the game isn't quite over yet. While stumbling around in this hellscape, Lisa finds a VHS tape with no label, and also finds she can return to the lobby. She carries the tape to the TV that sits in the lobby and plays it. She is transported to another section of her anguished mind, yet this one seems insulated from the chaos that runs the rest of it, a sort of safe place somewhere Lisa can retreat to to escape her torment. She searches this space, looking for the thing that resides here that helps protect her from the mayhem. She finds it, a woman who has long black hair just like she does. 
The woman calls to her, and although her face is obscured, Lisa approaches, eager to be comforted. But she notices the woman's voice is strange. Just as she stands a few paces from the woman, she sees her face and is horrified. She takes a step back as the woman's face is revealed to be Marty's. He's managed to worm his way into every aspect of Lisa's mind, even the safest and most sacred of places. Lisa runs from the woman and she begs her not to go, that she can't... She can't run. A game over screen emerges from the darkness, indicating the end of Lisa. And that is a summary of Lisa the First. I hope you enjoyed the time spent watching the video. I tried the best I could to compile everything in a clear and concise manner. It was a little difficult putting everything in order due to the open nature of the game, its world, and how you learn about the story, but I hope it wasn't too bad. Now, Lisa the First was followed up with a full-fledged sequel titled Lisa the Painful that I would recommend playing as it expands on the story and the aftermath of Lisa's struggle, although in a slightly unexpected manner. Finally, I would like to thank everyone that watched this through. I really appreciate it. And that's it, so thank you for watching and see you later.